After debuting on this week's episode of AEW Dynamite, Matt Hardy did the now traditional follow-up step, bashing WWE on Chris Jericho's Talk Is Jericho podcast. In the episode, Hardy spoke at length about his time on the Indies, his debut in AEW, and, of course, Vince McMahon. The podcast is a fascinating listen, but if you haven't got time to download it, because everyone's so busy these days locked in their houses, here are the 10 biggest takeaways from the podcast. The creative process in WWE comes up a lot in the episode. It wasn't just an hour of McMahon bashing saying no to stuff. Much like Mox's appearance on Talk Is Jericho after he left WWE, Hardy's episode reveals just as much about how AEW book their storylines. Hardy and Jericho both contrast AEW's style to WWE's style, and both agree that AEW is much better. So what is it? I think basically, you know, the whole framework of AEW from what I've seen so far is there's like an outline. This is kind of where we want to go. This is kind of how, what we'd like to do to get there. How do you suggest we get there? Mm -hmm. And then the talent fills in the blanks and, and that's, that's magic. This is in stark contrast to WWE's booking, which seems to change from week to week and has no long-term strategy in place, reportedly even tearing up scripts hours before shows for last minute McMahon directed rewrites. It makes long-term storytelling almost impossible unless the aim is getting over Roman Reigns. AEW's more considered approach allows the wrestlers to tell stories that they want to tell, like arguably the best narrative in wrestling right now, Hangman Page's strained relationship with the Elite. Meanwhile, in WWE, Eric Rowan had a spider in a cage and then Drew squished it. The most serious part of the podcast episode came when Matt spoke about the low points in his life, specifically when he left WWE in 2010. He was let go in 2005, rejoined WWE later that year, but requested his own release in 2010. The reasons for this were plentiful, but Hardy shed some light on what it was like being on the road in that period. After running hard for so long, and especially all the stuff we did as, you know, Team Extreme and the Hardy Boys, all the crazy bumps and TLC matches nonstop, it's just like my body, I couldn't perform like I used to in 2010. And then I remember saying like, you know, I'm hurt. I need to, I need to take some time away. I need to do this. And I'm like, no, you're a very dependable guy. You can help young, new green talent. You can, we can put you out on the road with a big guy and you can help teach them and, and get them through the match and make them feel comfortable. And I just kind of wasn't able to come off the road. Hardy would go on to say that instead of time off, he was always prescribed pills instead. And to help cope with the stress of working with WWE, he would take a couple more so he didn't feel the stress so much. Hardy, of course, has a very public history with drugs and alcohol, even being fired from TNA for a DUI while he was already suspended. While these aren't necessarily direct allegations from Hardy, the insinuation is that WWE doctors not giving him the time off to heal and instead prescribing him pills was a contributing factor to his personal demons. These are some very serious and damaging allegations against WWE and definitely some that might stick with listeners of the podcast. I'll be curious to see if WWE respond to this in any way or if Chris Aman has another lawsuit about it. Awkward segue into something nowhere near as serious. We also learned on the podcast that the broken Matt Hardy character came about because of the physical toll on his body from the Hardy Boys days when he was speaking about his return to the Indies after he had taken the time away to heal up mentally and physically. And then I was like, okay, I can do this. I just have to change the way I work. I have to be smarter. I have to work uh, in, in a way that is relative to my age and, and, and the way my bump card has been filled up at that point. You know, and that's that's actually why Broken Matt Hardy started in the beginning, just so I would be more entertainment driven, more, you know, much more of a character than anything else. It certainly paid off with Hardy becoming one of the biggest things in wrestling back in 2016 and 17 before his return to WWE at WrestleMania 33. Speaking of that return at WrestleMania, it wasn't just him as he did it alongside his brother Jeff. The pair debuted as a team and have mostly remained together throughout their careers despite occasional split-offs into singles careers and feuds against each other that nobody wanted to see. Matt spoke about how Jeff was always the brightest star and the more popular of the two, but it was Matt who had the better wrestling mind. As Jeff would always approach Matt and ask him what it was he should do, and Matt nurtured that to make Jeff the star. And not only that, as Matt then looked out for his little brother Jeff in Impact as well, including him into the broken universe. And I was like, really? Like, I want to do this 
so you don't do a whisper and a win and a swan time during every match and you don't dive out of the ring two times every match. Right. I want to like preserve your body too. That's why I'm forcing you to be Brother Nero and you can't be a spot monkey anymore. And, and, and he was like, what? <laughs> we also learned Jericho hates flips. Damn spot monkeys. While Jericho and Hardy were speaking about how character rather than athletic ability really connects you with fans on a deeper level, the champion went off on people practicing 720 flips and double moonsaults just before fans get into the arena, name dropping both Brandon Cutler and QT Marshall as the worst offenders in AEW. Oddly, in an episode about Matt Hardy, the creation of the broken gimmick is defection from WWE to AEW and more. The best reveal is that Senor Benjamin is the nicest man in the world. The real-life father of Matt Hardy's wife, Rebby, Senor Benjamin was a superintendent in New York and knew absolutely nothing about the wrestling business when he was first introduced as the character, but he still did it anyway because he's the best. He also has a legitimate interest in gardening, and so his character became a gardener in the broken universe. English isn't his first language, so a lot of the time he needed to be told in Spanish what exactly was going on. I don't care what language it's in, the broken universe lore is still going to be confusing. Once the Hardy Boys nostalgia pops wore off for their WWE return, fans started wanting the broken Matt character it made such a phenomenon in Impact. His first feud was with Bray Wyatt, with the Wyatt vs Broken families being an often fantasy book topic over the years, and the storyline climaxed in the broken brilliance of an ultimate deletion match with which main evented Raw. According to Matt, the pair had pitched an entire story surrounding the two, how Bray could be integrated into the Broken Family and the Broken Universe. But Vince McMahon didn't listen, put a stop to it, and then had them wrestling four minute matches on Raw instead. Bray had his compound burned down by Randy. You know, like he'd lost his Wyatt family. <laughs> I had deleted him in the lake, he didn't have anything, but now he was my tag team partner because I'd cleansed him of Abigail. Have him show up with like, you know, a, a stick with a bandana tied on, like a hobo. Like, <laughs> this guy shows up and he's like, hey, well, I don't have anywhere else to go. Can I just crash here at the Hardy compound? You know, and then once he gets to the Hardy compound, we'll do things like, okay, you have to be part of the family. Senior Benjamin's like, okay, it's, it's your turn to ride the moor of lawns. You have to mow the grass. <laughs> You know, or maybe like King Maxwell comes out, you know, and he's like bossed him around. Unfortunately, we never got any of that on WWE TV because what we really wanted was all those squash matches against the B team. Mm. Speaking of Vince not liking things, the majority of this podcast episode can be summed up with Man, doesn't WWE creative just suck a big bag of dicks? On several occasions, Jericho and Hardy talk about the freedom they have for their characters outside WWE and how restrictive it is inside WWE, especially with Vince McMahon helming the show. Nothing encapsulated this more than Vince's reaction to watching the finished version of the Ultimate Deletion match in the production meeting before Raw. But like he watched it in the production meeting and a few people in there had watched it already. But after it was over and ended, everybody like clapped and stood up and he was just kind of like looking around and he told a couple people, I just, I don't get it. Yeah. I just, I don't get it. Yeah. I mean, if it does good, if it, if it does a number, then I'm truly out of touch. I think he said that. <laughs> you know, it, it, it kept the audience over 3 million viewers, which was cool. Yeah, yeah. You know, and they it, would love that now. You know, right? Nobody gets 3 million views you know, now. So, so, so it, still, it, it did okay. Matt also revealed how, at the end of one WWE segment, Hardy started doing his broken laughing. Yes! And Bray Wyatt started to laugh back. Vince thought this was such good S-word, so they were made to laugh in every segment from then on even if it wasn't funny. On Hardy's way out of WWE in February, he was used to put over young up-and-comer Randy Orton, where he was written off TV from a concerto from out of nowhere. He turned up the next week to be attacked again, but this wasn't the original plan. After the first attack, the plan was for Hardy to have a two-segment match with Orton the following week, but Raw Creative got cold feet once they finally realized Matt wasn't actually going to re-side. Paul Heyman even took Hardy to one side to ask him if he was going to leave. To which Hardy responded, he didn't know. And he wanted to be creative, and that's what's most important to him. So yes, basically I'm leaving. After that conversation, WWE changed the segment to just having Randy attack him again instead. Not even a week later, Matt let his contract expire. And finally, Hardy said his new aim for the final chapter of his in-ring career is to elevate younger talent. He originally made a pitch to Vince McMahon to do just that in WWE. 
WWE about a recurring segment that would help get over underutilized talent. But Vince just ignored him. And I love it here. And you guys said in December of 2018, you were going to start listening to the fans. And I don't think you have. And I want to. And what I pitch is give me 15, 10 to 15 minutes of the show. And I want to call it the broken block. I said, and my idea was like, give me underutilized guys like Chad Gable and Ali and Apollo, guys that aren't being utilized at all. Let me put them on that show. Let them do badass things. Let me put some vignettes with, from the Hardy Compound and House Hardy and just give me like 10 to 15 minutes and I'll call it the broken block every show and just see how it does. Jericho adds that he actually pitched a similar idea called the Jericho Junction, which ended up becoming the highlight reel, where he would take underutilized wrestlers and do a promo with them in the ring, to which Vince replied, I love it, your first guest is Goldberg. You know, young up and comer Goldberg. Vince thought Goldberg, was underutilized. The highlight reel then became just another talk show segment on WWE TV. What's your biggest takeaway from Matt's Talk is Jericho podcast? Let us know in the comments because I'll be replying from out of nowhere. And what are the 10 funniest moments from the Attitude Era? Click on the video on the right to find out on what a 10 wrestling heel turns that massively backfired. Click the video below that to watch more. I've been Ollie Davis and that was wrestling.